Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast by Bangalore International Centre, bringing you conversations that move, inform and encourage discourse. A great genius of police who used to work in Nizam state decided on his grasp of what Europeans call anthropology at that time, decided on the basis of anthropology that in India, if a Brahmin son necessarily becomes a priest and a merchant son necessarily becomes a Vaniya, Baniya, then a criminal son or daughter will necessarily be criminal. Therefore, not just this conclusion, action followed. This police officer, Stephen, wrote in a report that therefore these people should not be allowed to procreate. Indians belong either to castes or to tribes. What makes a tribal people tribal or Adivasis? What have been their cultural traditions, their thought patterns and their philosophy of life? What led to some of them getting branded as criminal tribes? What is the future of the culture of the Adivasis in the 21st century world? This lecture by thinker, cultural activist and literary critic Professor Ganesh Devi will present views of the speaker based on his experience of creating the Adivasi Academy at Tejgarh and a global network of the indigenous peoples. This lecture will offer a perspective on the rapidly disappearing continent of culture that the indigenous of the world inhabit. This episode is an extract from the second talk of the Masterclass series, Memory, Culture and the Being of India by Ganesh Devi, which took place in early February 2022, at the Bangalore International Centre. And now, over to Professor Devi. I said that India is India because Indians know there are many beginnings. Because Indians are capable of living all at once in many times. Today, I shall move into another pitch and think of how Indians are able to live in many spaces. To begin with, at least in the Sanskrit language, we have a very fascinating opening for getting into this idea of many spaces. And that opening comes from the notion of non-space, zero, nothing, absence. Well, the Latin words for zero would be a matter of study. But for the Sanskrit language, uh, which has uh, an intimate relation with many languages in the country, though not with all languages in the country, at least in the case of the Sanskrit language, which works in many cases, in the case of many languages, like the topping in a pizza, with the base being Prakrut and the topping being Sanskrit. But nonetheless, the Sanskrit is pervasive in that language. The word for absence, non-space, zero, would be Shunya. And Shunya is vacuous, empty. There's nothing there to see in it. It is there, and you can see it because there is nothing there in it. But there is another word in the Sanskrit language for Shunya, and that is Purna. Probably those of you who are familiar with the Hindi script, Devanagari script, know that when a sentence ends, we use Purna Viram. That is indicator of an empty space. Break in a nothing. This Purna is also an indicator of a space. But this space is filled with things. And it is filled in such a wonderful way that if you take things out of that, it still remains filled. And if you add things into it, it is still never insufficient to accommodate those things. There is a very famous Upanishadic 
line about this, how you can uh, divide uh, this Purna with any damn thing in the world and it yet remains Purna. Whatever you do to Purna, Purna will remain Purna. Because Purna is here. Now that's a very complex philosophical challenge for us. Because here is a clear foundation for space. But Purna is an emptiness. And therefore, there can never be a here without anything being there. But I'll not get into that level of intellection. I'll just accept on the face of it, Purnam, Idam, Purnam, Adam, etc., etc. You probably have heard of this. So there is Shunya, which is vacuous. There is Purna, which is filled with things in such a manner that those things become, by the act of being inside Purna, immortal, eternal never dying, never diminishing. There is, ladies and gentlemen, a third version of this, and that is Kh. Kh. There's an absolutely fascinating essay by Anand Kumar Swami on the philosophy of Kh. What is Kh? In Marathi language, Kh has given rise to many words. For instance, Khagola Shastra. Kh is sky, the skies. A word for birds is khag, that which is gochar, that which is mobile, inside kh. And what is this kh? Kh is an emptiness, a non-ness, a non-space surrounding all of us. But in such a manner that as against Purna, which is things in it which never die, inside Kha, there is nothing which is permanent. Everything dies there. And yet, it is emptiness which is spatially indicated, marred, by the word Kha. Now, why am I getting into this nitty-gritty of the Sanskrit language and so many notions of non-ness, zero? just to place before you for your consideration the fact that the mind of people in this subcontinent, the minds of people in this subcontinent have felt perfectly at ease with the idea of many spaces being there all at the same time. They did not eliminate Kha because Purna was there. They did not remove Purna out of their script or language or conversation because Shunya was there. Cultural memory gets assailed in times of contraction of people's will to be themselves. When the being of a people comes under an attack, a cultural attack or a natural attack, people try quite often away from their vision of time and space. Language is the bridge between one's consciousness and the world out there, phenomenal world. And I'd also said that this bridge works within the framework of time and space. We construct through our idea of time and through our idea of space what is out there. India is constructed by Indians in terms of their understanding of times and their understanding of spaces. When this understanding changes, when a cultural amnesia overpowers us, possesses us, in a way transforms us, displaces us, the effects are felt socially as well as politically. I'll take some examples to explain how this idea of many spaces got contracted socially and is getting contracted politically. First, to a couple of social examples. First, about society and then about polity. Because it is society that is the foundation of polity. Not an ideology, but society itself. What it is and what it is not as well. We are in the month of February 2022. This month brings to my mind 
the memory of something that happened exactly 150 years ago. That is in the year 1872. In that year, a murder took place. Let me tell you the story of this murder. I don't subscribe to the idea of murdering anybody, but I am only bringing the memory of that event that re remains in my mind for sharing it with you. In 1871, a year before 72, before February 72, the new Governor General in Calcutta, Lord Mayo, decided to bring in a legislation. That legislation was called the Criminal Tribes Act of India. This legislation has a little bit of story behind it. So let me, in order to complete my story, let me get into that story as well. First, it was the end of the 18th century, almost all princes were defeated by the East India Company soldiers or they had lost nerve. But definitely by 1818, with the fall of the Peshwas, the East India Company had a fairly good hold over all of the previously existing states. The nature of the treaties varied, but the control nonetheless was there. And at that time, the disbanded soldiers of those princes became an issue for the East India Company. The soldiers were on the payrolls of the princes previously. But not being able to maintain the armies or not being able to support the armies, fund the armies, the soldiers had to be let loose and they were moving about. The British wanted to disarm these soldiers because they were a potential threat to the control of the East India Company over the princely states. They appointed a, a, an officer, uh, Sleeman, for detecting the flow of the arms or clashes or violent uh, instances. And Sleeman worked mainly in Central India, but not just in the center of Central India, also he worked also to the west and the east of Central India and covering a little more than what was the Central Indian province. He listed these instances of armed clashes for over 25 years, but he listed all these instances by mention of the community of the persons. And that list of communities was used after 1857, which was a jolt to the company rule. And the company, in fact, lost the control and the sovereign had to come in. British king or queen was to be the emperor or empress of India after 1857. The list, the Sleeman list, the Sleeman list of communities, the Sleeman list of communities that were suspected to be criminal by habit was brought to use and put in the form of an enactment in 1871 producing the infamous Criminal Tribes Act of India. This act had an appendix giving the names of communities. And these names, I mean, if you look at those names now, you will be surprised beyond limit. The very first name was Meena. Now, who were the Meenas? I mean, we know Meenas belong to Rajasthan. Many IAS and IPS officers by the name Meena you might have met. Who were the Meenas? The Meenas were the coin makers of India. And why did the Meenas make coins in India? Because the coins used in Banaras and the coins used in Tanjore had a parity. It was not as if the king of Tanjore or king of Mysore or king of Kolhapur produced their own coins at an arbitrary value. It is that Hundi written somewhere in Travancore could actually be encashed somewhere close to Calcutta. 
because there was an economic framework which was over and above the powers of these princes within which the states worked voluntarily and if not voluntarily because of the course of history of indian economy the minas knew the proportion between the weight of a coin and the value of a coin they knew the necessary metallurgy to make those coins very often as a child i seen in hindi movies a mina bazaar and a mina bazaar is a place where metallurgical skills appear in the craft minas were listed as a criminal community they were not arm wielders they were not uh, arms smugglers but they came in the way of the british desire to create their own mint the british wanted to mint their own coins with the stamp of either the empress or the emperor on it the king or the queen of britain appeared on the coin and those who made coins those who made those other coins became counterfeiters and the counterfeiters were at the top of the list of the criminal tribes of india second in that list even more tragic throughout the 13th century the 14th 15th 16th 17th and 18th century security was provided for women by a policing system particularly women of the political class the rani vamsha the queens if you like to call them queens rani vamsha was given security by a specially trained group of soldiers called hijras and they had their own skills in use of arms which were necessary for their purpose the second in the list after minas is hijras they became a criminal tribe when today's transgender activists uh, might feel you know get boiling with rage at this terrible uh, criminalization demonization of an, an entire community not individuals an entire community the list goes on and on i mentioned the other day in informal uh, conversation that the wadars who are excellent stone masons and who understand the geological structure of uh, rocks beyond description because they got centuries of training from the times of king ashoka who did the rock edicts who built those rock edicts the wadars of this country the wadars because they use a heavy hammer were listed in the criminal tribes these three are examples that we can easily understand but there are others in that list and in order to understand their inclusion i had to move the story further back in history because all these stories are interconnected let me take a step back in history and then add that story to the main story that i am trying to present before you in europe during the 100 years war the british and the french sovereign always felt very shaky because the task of maintaining soldiers was done by the barons and the lords the king or the queens did not have their own soldiers as such in order to maintain a paid army and you know that we often give this great credit to napoleon bonaparte for creating trained army but trained army was a step possible because there was a paid army in order to create a paid army so that there is the requisite number of soldiers available in times of any war emergency on either side of the channel the british first and then the french decided to change their taxation structure and this happened throughout the 17th century and up to the beginning of the 18th century what was the change in the taxation structure the change was earlier tax collected was levied on the measure of yield what things you got in the farm were required to be taxed in that measure the change was slight but it was a very fundamental change the change was instead of levying tax on the yield the king started levying tax on the area of the farm because yield varies from year to year in a good year 
this excellent crop in another year, there's no crop tax variation, revenue variation. But land remains fixed in area. A hundred, a hundred acres land will remain 100 acres even 5 or 10 or 20 or 100 years later. That gave those kings or queens certainty of revenues, allowing them to engage armies in a fixed number and then fight their wars. Well, they were perfectly free to do so. But in this act was embedded a principle and the principle was that a taxpayer is related to land. A citizen must have some relation with land. If you are not landed or if you are not engaged in labor which is land related, if you do not have a land related address, if you do not have a land identity, then you became a non-citizen. This kind of mind was brought to India in the middle of the 19th century and the entire attitude to who is citizen, who is the Praja of the British Empire and who is not Praja, non-Praja, that discrimination got into action. So, everybody who was nomadic in India became a suspect in the eyes of the power that was there. And anybody who had land, land definition, land relation, was accepted as the Praja of whom the British government was the Mai Baf government. They were the children of the king or the queen. But the non-sedentary nomads were not seen as either the obligation of the state or the asset of the state. And who were the nomads? The Baul singers in Bengal. They got into the list of criminal tribes. And you know, Baul singers sing only of love for God. Tagore would be among the greatest Baul singers in that tradition in a way. Criminal tribes. The entertainers, the kaikadis, those who walk on rope, they became a criminal tribe. Not just that, but people who manage animal stock, donkeys, camels, cows, elephants, all of them became criminal tribes. The Barwads in Gujarat, criminal tribe. The Gadi Wadar, that is one who carries mitti from one place, criminal tribe. The Wanagujars in the Himalayas, criminal tribe. The Sadhus, the medicants, criminal tribes. The Bairagis, the difference between Sadhus and Bairagis, Sadhus are only given to God. The Bairagis also given to God and medicine at the same time. They distribute medicine as criminal tribes. Wandering singers, entertainers, people who had, who had caused diffusion of, you know, spread of information and culture in this country all through, you know, those who sold saffron or silk. They used to move all the way from Tibet or China to Kerala. But people like that came under the scanner. 1871 Criminal Tribes Act set the tone. The nomads of this country came to be seen as criminal tribes of India. That British story got mixed into the colonial story. And in 1871, a new attitude of looking at people emerged. It was refined. 1893 or 92, perhaps 93, another version of the criminal tribes. All of it was brought even to cover the Nizam state. And the Nizam state had so many varieties of lovers of God. Allah's people, so many of them, Madaris, Domaris, all those who moved between what was the erstwhile Nizam state and what was the ununited, uh, not yet formed Karnatak state across what are today's borders, they all came to be described as criminal tribes, the Yenadis, the Yarakulas. Between Rajasthan and Gujarat, those who moved from one to another culture, criminal tribes. 
not one or two or a dozen or two dozen communities, 191 communities were brought under the this Oppressive Act, 1871, 1893, then once again 1913, 1924, several versions of the Act, making it increasingly criminalizing, tormenting, oppressive. So many versions were delivered by the colonial rule. And a great genius of police who used to work in Nizam state decided on his grasp of what Europeans call anthropology at that time, decided on the basis of anthropology that in India, if a Brahmin son necessarily becomes a priest and a merchant son necessarily becomes a Vaniya, Baniya, then a criminal son or daughter will necessarily be criminal. Therefore, not just this conclusion, action followed. This police officer, Stephen, wrote in a report that therefore these people should not be allowed to procreate. Now, how to stop them from creating children? A method was invented, a peculiarly colonial method. The method was not to allow them to sleep during night. So they were forced to report to the nearest police station four times during night. And if you are required to go to the nearest police station and report there that, yes, I am present, obviously you won't have time to sleep with somebody to produce a child. In some cases, three times, in some cases, twice. The theory that somebody is born a criminal was not enough. They added yet another theory. And that theory came from child psychology as British understood it during the 1840s applied to India 40 years later. The child psychology theory was a product of a very upsetting social turmoil in Britain itself. That was called the Chartist movement. What was the Chartist movement? People who were fed up with the industrial production system where labor was not, not given enough wages for all the hours of work. People fed up with having to work for 15 hours, but being paid only for six hours of work, they were protesting. And on the forefront of that protest were children. Because in those times, where energy was produced still with the help of coal, primarily coal, the soot in the chimneys required to be cleaned very regularly. And the chimneys were narrow. I mean, all of you who've been to Britain and seen those row houses with chimneys you know, jutting out, know how difficult it would be to get into chimneys. Let's not laugh at the British. We are doing far worse to the people in India who clean our gutters today. We are not no more civilized. Neither worse nor better. Identical. Children had to get into chimneys. There are so many British poets who wrote about the chimney sweepers. In India, the upper class students studied Charles Lamb's essays on chimney sweepers as if this was great literature, work of beauty. But it was actually talking about these children dying inside the chimneys or falling dead. These children working for 14 hours in the factories, cleaning chimneys, hungry children, they were marching, they were wandering around in the streets of London. Any of you who has read any of Charles Deacon's novels will notice those children. They decided to come together and wrote a charter of demand signed by hundreds, thousands, in such a way that the, 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 the sheaves of paper collected formed a car load, and that car was driven to Buckingham Palace. Chartist demand, because this was a charter of demands. And what did the charter say? Single line. That line was equal days wages for equal days labor. Take 14 hours work from me, pay me 14 hours wages. The royalty appointed a commission to deal with this. And the commission came up with two extraordinary recommendations. Recommendation number one was, these children are not capable of learning Greek and Latin, but teach them English. So the first time English as a subject was introduced in British schools was after the Chartist movement. 
as punishment to the children. Thank goodness we have taken in this country that punishment for so many decades without realizing what is happening to us. It began as punishment. The second recommendation that came from the commission was, if the children do not get into behaving, even after teaching them English, put them in reformatory settlements. You know, all, the, all those villains that Dickens depicts tormenting those children are the, you know, sentries or the, are the wardens of those reformatory settlements. That idea of reformatory settlement was active in the British mind in 1840s. That was brought to India to deal with these nomadic communities and British rule in India created settlements here, reformatory settlements. The specifications were different because here they thought they were dealing not just with criminal children, but criminal adults who are capable of producing criminal children. The specification was that the fencing would be 14 feet tall, made of wire in such a way that not even a billy, not even a cat can jump across. And if you want to see the kind of fencing that was specified for these reformatories, these settlements, you must watch an Australian movie called The Rabbit Foot Fence. There was a wire net laid in Australia by the same you know, colonial era British power, which ran for about 800 kilometers, not allowing people on this side to move to the other side. I mean, that movie is about an eight-year-old girl taking two of her younger siblings along those 800 kilometers because that girl and her brother or sister, they brought to this reformatory settlement in Australia. Similar things happen in India. Criminal settlements, criminal community settlements were created in 52 locations. One in Tanjore, another in Hubli, one in Gadag, yet another in uh, Fulton in Maharashtra, then in Ahmedabad, in Indore, many places. These people were made to do work which was non-paid work. If some of you have visited the Gokak Dam, which is in Karnataka, or Bhadgar Dam in Maharashtra near Pune, you will notice that these are dams built during the decades when the labor which required no payment at all was available. This labor was used from the closest, for instance, the Hubli settlement labor was used for construction of Gokak Dam. The Fulton settlement labor was used for constructing the Bohor Dam the Nira, on the Nira River. Streets, railway lines, laying the railway tracks, constructing streets, constructing government buildings, all of that work was done by these people, 190 communities. The plight remained completely unknown to the rest of India, except for a very few leaders from the Congress of that time who were sensitive to you know, what was happening. Now, I said something happened 150 years before our present year. And what happened was this first Criminal Tribes Act was passed by Lord Mayo in Calcutta in October 71. Three months and three weeks later, Mayo was visiting Andaman. And at Port Blair, a person belonging to one such community from Northwest, who was deported from there to Andaman, his name was Sher Ali Afradi. Afradi killed Mayo. He used a knife to murder Mayo. I don't know if you had chance of looking at his. There are two statues of Mayo made. One was sent to Cumberland, which was his native place, and the other was kept in India. It was at Jaipur until very recent times, but then some controversy erupted, and now that statues moved to the Mayo School. The criminal tribes remained in this state till 1952, when India became independent. They did not become independent because they were still seen as criminal tribes. A gentleman called Ayangar worked to write a report in 1950, Ayangar Committee Report, and Jawala Nehru went all the way to Sholapur to cut open the barbed wire which made the fencing for the settlement in Sholapur, which was the largest, in August 1952, and freed them. By then, the schedule of caste was already ready, schedule of tribes was already finished, 
and therefore these people could get into neither the STs nor the SCs and remained hanging in between. For several decades, there was nobody to look after them till Mahashweta Devi, the Bengali writer, raised their voice. With Mahashweta Devi, I had the good fortune of working on this issue. And then we somehow managed to create a national commission for them. And that's a different story. I written about it in a book called A Nomad Called Thief. The population of these communities today, as estimated, because it has never been counted, since 1952, the elections, first elections were already held. The population of these people was never counted in any of the censuses, but 1931 had some census. And in that census, what your figures are given, if we go by increase in population and so on, today the population of these communities in India would be closely 14 crores, not a small population. But these communities are wiped out of our social space completely. A child belonging to any of these communities goes to a school, and even a small bit of a chalk is lost in the classroom, the teacher will first say, oh, Apne churaya hoga. If women of this community get into a lane or a locality, or, and now we have got into this terrible habit of making all our habitat gated, we have got gates and sentries there. A woman comes in to sell something. Women inside the families and houses say, oh, this lady, my, this woman might run away with your child. You might have heard of these stories. Suspicion haunts them. The nation looks at them with suspicion. They are seen even today as the Kanjars, the Sansis of Punjab, the Banjaras. Even today, they are seen as people who can entertain you from a distance, but not the people who can come any close to you, because close to you, they could be a potential danger. They could be a potential danger to you in your mind, because the idea of citizenship was designed way back in England in those centuries that teaches you to suspect nomads and value only the sedentary people. A space in our society is wiped out because this society had the provision of belonging to land as well as freeing oneself from land and wandering about. Walking around, wandering about, going on yatras, releasing yourself from the burdens of the material life was part of a vision of life. I will now come to a second example of how we've been wiping out space, spaces, many layers of spaces. I said socially and politically, in society and in polity. The second example is, of course, of the Adivasi. All of us know that in this country, in the subcontinent, one is either a member of a jati, member of a caste, or a tribe. One cannot be a tribe and yet be jati. One cannot be caste, yet be tribe. Now, are these tribes ethnically any different, ethnically any different from the people belonging to jatis? The answer is, in absolute clear terms, no. Genetics tells us that the entire South Asian population is of the same source, same stock. If all of us, 130 crores in this country, go for a genetic test, all of us will realize that we're all brothers and sisters. We all come from the same mothers who walked out of Africa. And this is not a claim that I'm making. A great scientist like David Rick, in a book which was published in 2018, I believe, who we are and how we came here based on more than 10,000 samples from CCMB of Hyderabad, the cellular and microcellular biology. Yet, there are tribes and there are castes. So how come the tribes are different from the castes? That's a question that we need to ask and we, we need to answer that question. The question is, why is it that I'm not a tribe or my wife is not a caste? Why, what is this identity? From where does it come? This identity comes from the times of the Indus civilization. In Harappa, because of the affluence that an urban civilization requires as its foundation, classification of work, categorization of work, labor practice had already happened. 
And that civilization had a fairly long time to allow this to happen. And those who made metals, those who made rocks, those who made wood, those who made cloth, those who made something else, different requirements of labor were fulfilled by the same stock of people, but acquiring different labor identities, different jatis. However, please allow me to pause here to reflect on one thing. The jatis of the Harappan civilization did not have an hierarchic arrangement. That hierarchy was brought in much later, almost 500 years after the Harappan civilization declined entirely and got wiped out. That sense of hierarchy came in with another language, another civilization entering the stream of the, the stock of people that existed here. Those who did not accept that new idea of hierarchy remained performing those tasks but did not get into the hierarchy of tasks and therefore not into the caste system. They remained outside the caste system, became our tribes in this country. Though genetically, we all come from the same stock. Why, I, I must add here, yet another uh, layer of this tribe identity. I mentioned the genetic uh, past of many of the tribes, but it is true that tribes exist in the world only outside Europe. You'll be surprised to know this. Europeans have some nomadic communities, some gypsies, but they all gone from Asia to or Eastern Europe to Western Europe. Colonialism created tribes in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States, the indigenous people, the aborigines, the Maoris, the Indians, by which the colonial powers meant people existing before us. That category could not be applied to African states where colonialism went. But with the African states, a completely different, but a terrible, terrible thing happened socially. And the terrible thing is, the entire map of Africa was drawn not looking at the landfall or the hills or the rivers of Africa, but in a drawing room in Geneva, in straight lines. Not consistent with the populations of Africa, but consistent with mathematical formulas that Europeans followed about the square kilometers, square miles areas. Because the map of Africa was a result of conclusion of a long war, Franco-Prussian War, 1871. Africa got mapped and that mapping resulted in partition of a large community into a large part and a small part, the small part in another larger community. Those who were the spillover were named as tribes in Africa. They're not like the indigenous people of the, you know, America, Canada, or Australia, New Zealand. Therefore, today in Africa, if one talks of the indigenous people and tribes and natives, there's a, a tremendously strong political annoyance, political annoyance in the minds of Africans. In India, the tribes here were not like people in the US or the indigenous. They were the people who did not accept the idea of hierarchy and therefore had disallowed the formation of feudal state among them. Tribes were people without rajas. Tribes were people who governed themselves in a community way. Let me go back to that year 1817 when all the princes were defeated, etc. The land belonging to the princes, the resources belonging to the princes, in a way, indirectly or directly were under the control of the British First East India Company and subsequently the emperor, the queen or the king. But there were areas where there was no prince to sign a treaty with. And that area remained outside the control of the king or the queen. In 1870s, that entire area was brought under a law but not passed in the Governor General's Council in Calcutta, passed in London. And that law declared all such areas in India 
as the sovereign domain. Sovereign, the king or the queen, domain, territory, control over territory. And do you know what the British did with the sovereign domain? Because they had to fight a constant war with the rising German power in Europe after Bismarck came to power. The British wanted to have a massive navy. The Germans had developed a new technique of creating navy because Germans had relatively poor access to the sea. They decided that the North Sea would be frozen and ships could be launched only in one part of the year. The Germans decided to create a large number of vessels to be launched in the seas all at one time in a short period. In order to create those large number of vessels, the Germans decided to grow forest in such a way that those trees become usable for making vessels all at a predicted time. If you go to Germany and look at the forest there, you'll notice that all trees are of similar height. What is your concept of forest? I mean, Vana, Upavana, completely different. This industrial forest, the idea began in Napoleon's uh, imagination, came to a fruition in the Germany. The British countered the German idea by creating their forest department in India, not in England. The British created a forest department, but there was no forest land in England. That land came from the tribal land, the non-hierarchic people's land in India, which was acquired by the British by this single act, sovereign domain. The Adivasis of India have fought many battles against this confiscation of land rights throughout the colonial times. The story goes all the way back to 1850s, where we had people like Siddhu and Kanu, and then the Santhal Rebellion, and continues all the way through the 20th century, where they say Birsa Munda. And of course, they did not get an Ambedkar because the Adivasis had refused to unite themselves in terms of a single theology. They did not become Hindu or Muslim or Christians. They were self-reliant. They knew the value of labor. They understood what is community domination, community ownership, community possession. And uh, their gods, in any case, were not located outside the space seen by the human eye. Those gods were located inside in their homes or around their homes. Even today, when somebody dies in Adivasi's community, they do not think that that person goes to heaven or hell outside the known universe. They truly believe that that person remains here, that the person goes outside the time that we experience, not space, but time. Very fascinating philosophical take on the question of disappearance, non-existence. Adivasi communities in this country were treated as step children of the British power, as a praja, but less than praja, because they were only there to provide resources such as timber, forest resources, that's all. And that attitude continued even post-independence. And if anyone from the Adivasi community raises voice, that voice is understood as violent rejection of the state. And indeed, it is a rejection of the state. Because the idea of the state imposed on Adivasis is not their idea of the state. I'm saying this because in the constituent assembly debates, Jaipal Singh had asked this question. In a colonized country, if a team ever went to the Olympics, that itself was a miracle. And if a team won a gold, that was more than a miracle. The first gold that India won was by a team laid by Jaipal Singh Munda. Adivasi, hockey, great hockey player. And he had even got into the ICS. He was educated at Cambridge. I mean, he may be Adivasi, but Cambridge educated, ICS man. He left ICS service and decided to go to Africa to look at the Adivasis in Africa, tribals in Africa to understand their situation. He was a great hockey player and he laid the hockey team of India at least for five Olympics, he, in the constituent assembly, asked 
the entire assembly one question. When the question of assimilation of states in the Indian Union came, he said, we too will join the Union. Will it be on equal footing? The answer given by the constituent assembly to Jaipal Munda was yes. When Adivasis come in, they will come in this India on equal footing. And it is the credit goes to Jaipal Singh that the northeastern states got their legitimate community councils. That the constitution had a schedule 5 and schedule 6, several rights going to Adivasis. Yet, after independence, the equal footing commitment was lost sight of. Soon after, Verrier Elvin died and Jawaharlal Nehru died. Verrier Elvin is another great name when we come to tribes. Ram Gua of Bangalore has written a wonderful biography of Elvin. Elvin prepared five principles. Nehru Act to treat Adivasis on equal footing. Elvin was educated in England with a doctorate. He came to Pune. He was with uh, Servants of India Society. Then he went to Gandhi, got influenced by Gandhi. Gandhi did not mind very Elvin smoking his cigarettes. He understood the sense of, you know, sense of freedom. So Elvin uh, stayed in Sabarmati Ashram in one room, the front room th that Gandhi used for meeting his visitors. And when Gandhi was put in jail that late night, the police came looking for Gandhi. Gandhi wrote on a piece of paper, uh, Verya, you take the help of Thakkar Bappa, go to Adivasis. Elvin took his command. With Thakkar Bappa's help, he went to Chhattisgarh and then to Madhya Pradesh. What was Madhya Pradesh? What is now Chhattisgarh, Rajnandgaon? And he described the Indian tribals for Indians for the first time. It was through Elvin's book that India, modern India, post-colonial India, India after since colonialism, understood Adivasis for the first time. Elvin's five principles were do not disturb them, treat them on their own terms. Do not think that you know their law is any inferior to our law. Panchashil, Nehru had sent him to the northeast frontier area, Nefa, which today we know as northeast. He described that in the book, what could be done for Nefa, what could be done for Arunachal Pradesh in particular, where he was staying at that time. Nehru wrote forward to that book and said, this is how India should treat the Adivasis. Nehru died and Elvin died, both in the 60s. And soon after that date, successive governments have looked at Adivasis as Naxalites. Successive governments have used Adivasis for gaining power in terms of vote banks, but Adivasis have never been vote banks because they are extremely individualistic in their orientation. And in the last 20 years, I have seen, I have worked with Adivasis for good three decades. I lived with them for years and years. I've spoken their languages. Last 20 years, Adivasis in this country are officially being described as Hindus. The name of Adivasi community, I mentioned Gujarat, Ratwa community in Gujarat. The birth certificate says Ratwa, Adivasi, bracket, Hindu. The Hindu is the hierarchic view of space and society. Adivasi is this non-hierarchic view of the world. But that view is being imposed on Adivasis. Today, the population of Adivasis in the country is roughly 11 to 12 crores. Between 8 and 9 percent of population. The denotified nomadic tribes were called denotified after Nehru withdrew the notification of criminality, though a notification of habitual offender was imposed which now has been withdrawn. These denotified and nomad, nomadic communities or denotified and nomadic tribes, which are not the tribes, the other communities I spoke about earlier, them and the Adivasis together form about one-fourth or one-fifth of Indian population. And that's a small section because they do not constitute the remaining four-fifths. I accept. But with these Adivasis and nomadic tribes are the largest numbers of spoken languages in the country. Largest number of cultural diversity features. If I get into talking about the Northeastern tribes, the Santas, the Mundas, the Bills, the Gons, 
the communities in the Nilgiris, Adiva, you know, Andamans, it will take a lot of time. I'll not get into it. I'll take the benefit of your prior knowledge of that great diversity. The great diversity is wiped out in our social existence. We have forced these people to become like us. And if they do not become like us, we treat them as criminals or undesirable part of our society. The social spaces are wiped out. Now I'll turn to from society to polity. I could have spoken something similar about the Sufis, the Parsis, and many, many, many other examples are there. But I've taken these two large chunks to talk about how we are hell-bent on reducing our idea of space. I'll now turn to polity. The same constituent assembly which took into consideration the feelings of Adivasis decided in its wisdom to make India a union of states. As we open the constitution, the very first part of the constitution says India, which is a union of states. Now, what is this union of states? It's not saying India is a country. The constitution does not say India is a nation. It's not saying this is Desh. It's not saying it's a Rajya. I mean, they could have said India, that is Bharat, is a Rajya. The word Rajya was available to them. Desh, they don't use a union of states. And what is this peculiar union of states? It is a reflection of the existence of India for over several thousand millennia, during which Indians remained there as belonging together, not through polity alone, or not through territory alone, not through sanskara alone, but through a finer philosophical understanding of existence. Indians belong together because they were so different. And so diversity is the second nature, the foundational principle of being India. Diverse. India was not there because of some universal characteristic, but diversal characteristics. India was not a university of nationalism. India was a diversity of social histories that the constitution accepted. And therefore, it created a central list, a state list, and a concurrent list. Some time back, I have taught in universities. I like to believe that education is my area of work. Therefore, I am keenly interested in education policy. Some time back, this country came up with what is known as the new education policy. Education famously belongs to the concurrent list and not to the central list. But the formation of the education policy was entirely centralized. And the education policy document was not referred to the states prior to its becoming a policy through an ordinance through a cabinet decision. Our federalism has got weakened to that extent. I mentioned education as one field, but I can go on mentioning so many things which form an attack on Indian federalism. The idea of India as a union of states is under attack. And this idea which is at the heart of the constitution, also tells us that if that idea is under attack, the constitution itself is under attack. And I'm not presenting to you my woes about co the constitution being under attack, though that is a terrible thing to happen. I'm, I'm presenting to you my agony about the very being of India, which is contrary to this kind of lack of understanding of our being a union of states our being a federation. I'm not thinking of federation of power centers of states. I'm thinking of federation at a philosophical level of many ideas of many layers of space and many layers of time. India is India only if it can think of itself in terms of many beginnings. India is India 
only if it can think of having many spaces available to itself. And for keeping those spaces available, India must perpetually remain a federation of states. I'll now conclude by just bringing one very important point to you for your consideration. I feel very proud that we are an in independent country. I, I feel jubilant when I think of uh, how we fought for our freedom, for our independence, so that we became a modern, free nation. Reason to feel proud, and I, I do feel very proud of that. However, in the history of freedom in the world, and history of nation all over the world, there's a slip, there's a gap. Throughout the second half of the 18th century and the 19th century, the world was struggling to see the idea of freedom manifest. The world was also struggling to see the idea of nation get manifested. The French Revolution was all about liberty. The American war was all about independence, freedom. The Irish struggle was the Irish freedom struggle. But the Italian struggle was Italian unification as a nation. And so was the German unification as a nation. All this happened through the almost 100 years from the French Revolution to the Irish movement for freedom. 1870, that's where the Irish movement, it reached India through Home Rule League. Annie Besant came and Tilak accepted that and then it became part of the Congress, freedom. What happened to this idea of freedom and idea of nation during the 20th century? The idea of nation in its strongest form was seen by the world in the mid 20th century, 30s and 40s through Italy and Germany and ranked against them were the nations that had fought for freedom, US, England, France. I do not have to explain this any further. I'm mightily proud of India's freedom movement because that freedom movement allowed us to articulate in no uncertain words that India is a union of states. It is a federation. It is a union of states because the idea of India that Indians are nurtured through the millennia has taught us to live in many spaces, nation, region, sub-region, in many deshas, many pradeshas, many uddeshas. The idea of India has taught us to live in many spaces and many times all at once. The moment we reduce our spaces or we reduce our understanding of history, we become less of Indians. To that extent, it is the death of memory and diminishing of this civilization. Dhaniwad. Thank you. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what you heard, please share it with family and friends. You can also leave us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible are Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarvanaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter to get regular updates on our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.